character starts one person at a time, and that's how we can build it. And I think if we can think about, and we're in leadership roles of setting personal examples of high moral and ethical behavior, not just what we say, but what we do, and and then mentoring at the schools of character and values at all grade levels. And of course, I think Hollywood could help by not glamorizing some bad behavior, bad character. But finally, of course, just parents doing their job of transferring good character traits to the children. So I think we all have a role in building the character one person at a time. It's time for another episode of The Sean Tabbitt Show, a podcast where I connect you with thought leaders from across the globe, digging into some of my favorite topics like personal development, marketing, spirituality, and pretty much any other shiny object that happens to catch my attention. Today, my special guest is Ed Douglas, and we're going to be discussing his book, 25 Truths, Life Principles of the Happiest and Most Successful Among Us. Ed, it's a great honor. Welcome to the show. Well, Sean, I'm really pleased that you're talking to me today. I'm just really excited to be here. Thank you very much. Well, Ed, I know that you are going to be new to many of my listeners, so I'd like to start our conversation off today with what we might call the Ed Douglas origin story. So like me, a lot of the folks listening are meeting you for the very first time. So tell us a few things that we need to know about you. Well, sure, Sean. Well, I was born in uh, St. Joseph, Missouri. I went to school at Northwest Missouri State in Maryville, moved to uh, Chillicothe, Missouri, where I live uh, out of college, uh, which actually uh, is a separate story is the home of sliced bread. Uh, I'm kind of the head of that committee. And I was a uh, banker for 32 years. Uh, last 20 of which I was president, chairman, and CEO of a billion-dollar bank, and I'm still on the board and chairman emeritus. I have a, currently a certified financial planning practice, uh, do some bank consulting. I'm a presiding commissioner of our county, actually, and I was a, a volunteer tennis coach for uh, 19 seasons. I'm a member of the 50 States Marathon Club. The most important thing of all, I should tell you, is uh, my wife of uh, 42 years, Marla, who's my greatest asset, and we have three wonderful kids, and four grandchildren, and actually my church, my middle son, is our pastor. So uh, that's a little bit about me. Well, thank you for that, Ed. Now that we know a little bit about you, let's get into the story behind the book. I'd love to hear a little bit about what sets you down the path of writing 25 Truths. I had written a couple of finance books. One was about the importance of saving and the power of compound interest, making a million with only $2,000. Every young person can do it. And then I wrote a book, kind of a brief financial plan called The Money Marathon, Seven Simple Steps to Financial Freedom, kind of comparing the steps to running and training for a marathon to the steps of financial freedom. And then it, you know, it's, a, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. But this really started out, this 25 Truths, I actually just started out, Sean, as a list of things that I wanted to... Uh, share with my kids and grandkids. And then I got, I thought, well, you know, my tennis kids who I was coaching on the high school team, those are my kids too. And so what I started doing was sharing these one a day with them. And unbeknownst to me, I had a um, friend of mine who had a foreign exchange student on the tennis team and they were sharing these things at the dinner table. And so this friend came to me and he said, Ed, I'd like you to give a talk at a chamber group. And and I did. And then he said, Ed, he came to me and said, you need to make this into a book. And I thought, no, that's, I don't have the qualifications to do that. I've, you know, and I, so I, I resisted at first, but he kind of kept on me, which I appreciated. And I really warmed up to it and put it together in a self-published book. And then uh, Harrison House and, and the good people at Harrison House and Nora Media, I sent it to them and they liked it. And we got it uh, republished, changed the subtitle a little and the cover and uh, really came out very nice, in, in my opinion. And uh, so I was off and running. I'd love to hear a little bit about when the power of life principles became real to you. I mean, you just mentioned that you were in a place where you want to make sure you shared these with your kids. You were sharing them with the students you were coaching on the tennis team. But for you, was there a mentor in your life or how did these sorts of principles first begin to take shape for you and make a difference in your life? That's an interesting question. I share in the book, you've got to believe, where in my own life I had. Uh, when I was about a junior in high school, I had my uh, best friend's dad give me a book of John when I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks with a stomach ailment. And I read it and asked Christ in my life. And for me, the biggest difference was that I had just been kind of sliding by. And once I accepted Christ, I knew that God loved me and had a plan for my life. And I started giving my best. There's a big difference between giving your best and just sliding by. And so that made a huge difference. 
in my life. And this book is not at all meant to be a substitute for the greatest truths of the Bible, and but it's just meant to be kind of a motivational, inspirational guide that's built around Christian principles. And so it's interesting, when the book was getting published, I started reading all the problems we have with character in our country. And then that's what the book's about. Again, character and values from a Christian perspective. And I like to think of the glass as half full, but we all know there's plenty of problems to go around in our world today. But I was reading about just the time the book was coming out about how we've pulled away from authors and we've pulled away from the character and values that has made our country great, that that's really been the foundation of our country. And we've pulled away in areas like industriousness and integrity and religion and marriage. So as I was reading about all of that, it just seemed so timely for the book coming out. I actually had some friends that sponsored me to go around to uh, high schools. And, uh, and so in the last several years, I've probably talked to 65 schools of, and statewide conventions, maybe over 5,000 students. And so I really love doing that. And then it really not Fairly recently, it kind of expanded. I had a CEO of an electric cooperative a friend of mine come to me and he said, Ed, I've read your book and I think that our company's success is taking it to the next level is about character and values. And so I expanded my one hour talk to a two hour seminar on character and values and business ethics because really successful businesses, the number one trait is ethical behavior, which is about character and values. I think you can bring back a, a lot of the problems in the world to faith and religion and to character and values. And I'll give you an example of that, Sean, how you can tie things back. You know, sometimes people say, we don't have enough good paying jobs. And and so we need to work on how we get more jobs in the country. And then someone will say, well, wait a minute, it's not a jobs problem. It's an education problem. We need to improve our educational system. But then if you take that back farther, you know, we know that because of broken homes and things like that, that there are any young children that are totally unprepared for school. And when they get into school in that case, sometimes they're nearly doomed to failure. And so those children that are coming from broken homes that have insufficient learning and stimulation and parenting necessary for success, really the underlying cause is kind of a character issue because character would require unselfishly putting the children first and uh, giving the children the love and nurturing and parental attention necessary for them to succeed. So I can tie a lot of things back to character. And so uh, that's how I got into the book and some of the talks. And that's kind of my own little uh, personal uh, ministry, I'd say. Well, and for this kind of a book, I always like to be sure that we have some time in the middle part of the interview to get into a little bit of the meat that you cover. And you have so many great principles in the book that it was hard to pick just one or two, but I did narrow it down to a couple that I think the audience will really enjoy hearing about. So first, I'd like to have you talk to us about not talking negatively about others. I feel like that's a big challenge for people today. We see people kind of beating (laughs) each other up in the news, on social media, in kind of the decorum about being kind and treating others with respect. I feel like that gets thrown to the wayside. So why do we need to be mindful about not talking negatively about other people? Absolutely. And I should tell you, Sean, it's interesting you pick that because any time I make a talk, I use that as a disclaimer without disclosing all the sins that I've ever committed. You know, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I said, I'm rather than tell you everything I've ever done wrong. And when I talk to students, I tell them I've been around on this earth 68 years, so I've had a lot more time to make mistakes than you kids. But this one I'll talk about because none of us are perfect and it's not about being perfect. It's about trying to get better and, and working to get better. And so what I tell people in my disclaimer has, have you ever talked negative about people? Yeah. But you know what? When I do, I don't like myself because I know it's not the right thing to do. And so I think it's so important because when you really think about it, when you're, people are important. And if you're talking negatively about people, you're somewhat trying to elevate yourself at someone else's expense. And I don't think that takes a lot of maturity to do. And it's so easy to get into a group where you someone starts talking about someone and you can get part of it and carried away. And of course, in today's world, we, as you see, everyone, people get criticized right and left. It really is an issue. And I encourage people that people are important and sometimes you have to be factual, but I encourage people when you're thinking that you're going down that route of being negative, 
to think about being factual as opposed to hurtful and subjective because people are important and we should try to elevate them. So to give you an example, I, I mean, I could say if Shaw and I was your boss or something, you, you know, there might be a situation, let's say you were late for work, but there's a big difference between saying, Sean, you were late for work, which might be a fact and going to Sean's a jerk, which is subjective and hurtful. And so I just think it's real important. And I think in some respects, I was kind of natural at this. And I remember when I was in college, my best friend, I was running for student body president, and he asked about a a fellow that was running for vice president. And I said something like, I don't know about that guy. And, uh, And he kind of, my friend jumped back a couple and says, oh my gosh, this guy must be terrible. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you never talk bad about anybody. And I, I, I knew <laughs> then that it was very, very important that people are important and I should try to continue with that. And as I said, do I ever talk negative about people? Yes, but I know it's not right and I don't like myself when I do it. Next, Ed, I'd love to have you talk to us about the principle of making every day your best day. And honestly, for me, you know, I'm a guy in my 40s and when, when I want wisdom about making the best of every day, I'm looking to talk to people who are in your generation who are a bit older than me and have experienced way more life than I have. So what can you teach me, Ed, about making the best of every day? Well, I think it's so easy for us to let the little things ruin our day. My wife mentioned to me several years ago, she said, I used to hum this song. I used to hum this melody, something good's going to happen to you. And she says, why aren't you doing that anymore? And I thought about it and I thought, you know, it was a way to get my day started that the day was going to be a good day and I was just going to make it a good day, regardless of the little things that can set you off. Someone looks the wrong way at you or doesn't speak with you or, or said, says something that seems to be, and, and we lose the big picture of how blessed we are and God loves us and we're in a wonderful country and we've got our freedoms and our prosperity and our families and our friends. And, you know, we can lose sight of the big picture. Sean and I told you about accepting Christ, my own uh, personal uh, story. And I actually use an acronym to help me each day of John. And for me, it's about that J stands for keeping my joy, not letting the little things allow me to miss the big picture. And then the O for me, which is probably kind of unique, is staying organized. If I get disorganized, it tends to frustrate me and stuff. So that's probably just kind of a personal thing. And the H is about being helpful. If you're Helping someone else, it's pretty hard to get down. And then the end is just not being negative towards people, which we've already talked about. But it's interesting. One of my favorite movies, Sean, is City Slickers. I don't know if you've seen that movie. Oh, but, yeah. Uh, Fantastic there's film. A, there's a part in it where they talk about, you know, what's your best day and what's your worst day. In my seminars, I use a little uh, training where I ask people in the audience to share with me their best days. And as you remember from the movie, they say, You can't use when your kids were born. That's too easy. But anyway, I get some real interesting responses. I know I had one person who was a CEO of a a hospital, and he said, my best day was when I got fired from the bank and and, uh, that he was working at. And I I said, why was that? And he said, because that led to me getting this, my lifelong job of, of heading this hospital group. And I had another person that told me that his best day was he was on a beach with his wife. He took a picture of his wife, and there was a rainbow over it. And That day, his wife had just been told that she was cancer-free. It's really interesting to hear what your best day is. and uh, But it's all about just not letting the little things steal our joy. I think that's an important concept. Well, Ed, thanks for giving us a preview of some of the types of material we're going to encounter in the chapters of the book. I wanted to make sure we make mention of this special section you have at the close of each chapter. There's a section titled Workshop. I would love to have you just share a little bit about how have you seen that used in small groups and discussion groups? There are short chapters, but man, you've got a lot of meaty questions and opportunities to think and interact with the content we just read. So tell us about that. It's designed such that, you know, as you said, each, and, and I think this is especially important for kids and young adults and things, because they may not want to have the attention span to read through a whole book, but since there's several pages at a time and then questions after it, it's really designed for a parent to share with his children a teacher to share with his or her students, and a coach to share with the student athletes. And uh, I've even had, uh, oh gosh, on my website, there's about 90 or 100 reviews by homeschoolers. Really, the thought is that the book can serve as a guide. And as you know, in the book, I share some of my own experiences on each one of these 25 truths, but I actually encourage 
whether it's a parent or a teacher, to put in their own experiences as it relates to that particular truth. And I think that's even the most effective. So that's how I see it being used. In terms of the journey of the reader, you know, when they get to the last page of 25 Truths, if they have heard one (laughs) message, one core idea loud and clear from their time spent with the book, what do you most hope that is? I'll give you a couple of things, Sean. The, the, uh, I have to tell you, it, when uh, Harrison House and Nora Media were republishing the book, they called me and they said, we're publishing it tomorrow. Is there any truths you've forgotten? I said, no, 25 truths is just right. And I don't have, you know, people can have their own in the dish, but I said, that's a good number and I'm fine with that. And well, the next morning I woke up in a cold sweat and I called him back and I said, wait a minute. I said, you know, I don't have another truth but I've left out something that summarizes all of them. And I called it the plus chapter because it summarizes all those truths. And it's it's called all you need is love. And uh, the meaning of that is that no matter what you do, if you don't do it with love, it doesn't matter. And as we know, God is love. And I think the things that around that time that really got me to not miss that out is my uh, first grandchild was born in London and I got to see how much my son and daughter-in-law loved that little girl. And I, I knew how much we did. And it just reminds you how much God loves us and how much we're supposed to love others. And also just nearly within a month of that, I had, uh, we'd been at a wedding in Tulsa on driving back to Missouri. We went through, uh, on a Sunday, Joplin, Missouri. And about an hour later, an F5 tornado went through Joplin. And a week later, I went down with our church to see that devastation of the 160 some people that were killed and the 4,000 homes that were torn down. And we were picking up pieces at little at houses and things. And, and I was just amazed by people had lost what you might have thought was everything, but they were so overwhelmed by the love and support that people were giving them that, it, that they, those things were just things. And you realize that. And we were about a block away from a pizza hut that had been destroyed. And I learned the story of that pizza hut when the tornado was coming. The manager uh, knew he needed to act fast, and he rounded up the 19 people in a freezer where he thought well, they might be safe, and the tornado came and tore down the Pizza Hut. The 19 people, the one thing that stayed was the freezer, and the 19 people survived, but the manager had tied a kind of a rope thing around the door, trying to holding it shut, and although the 19 people in the restaurant survived, he was sucked up in and lost his life, and we know that no greater love is this than when a man lay down his life for a friend. So those are the two things that inspired me, but I really think that to really answer your question of what to leave with people in the book is that, you know, I think character starts one person at a time, and that's how we can build it. And I think if we can think about, and we're in leadership roles of setting personal examples of high moral and ethical behavior, not just what we say, but what we do, and and then mentoring at the schools of character and values at all grade levels. And of course, I think Hollywood could help by not glamorizing some bad behavior, bad character. But finally, of course, just parents doing their job of transferring good character traits to the children. So I think we all have a role in building the character one person at a time. Ed, for the listeners who'd like to connect with you, find out more about the book, where can they do that on the web? Well, I have a website. It's just eddouglas.com, E-D-D-O-U-G-L-A-S, eddouglas.com, where you can get my books and find out about seminars and certainly the 25 truths one. And, uh, and then I have actually a Facebook page, which well, they could like it's uh, 25 truths with Ed Douglas building character, one person at a time, get on my website. And if anyone has an interest in a seminar or whatever, I'm, I'm interested in that too. And so just again, as I said, this is kind of my personal little ministry and I enjoy doing it. It's just lots of fun to talk to students and and to talk to people and try to where we share together to to improve together. So I just really have been blessed with that opportunity and uh, really pleased, Sean, that you've uh, had me on the show to be able to talk about it. Well, like we do with every episode, we'll have detailed links in the show notes, places where you can connect with Ed and pick up your own copy of the book. It's time to bring this episode of the Sean Tabot Show to a close. Many thanks for being a part of my conversation with Ed Douglas. Once again, our book today was 25 Truths, Life Principles of the Happiest and Most Successful Among Us. To connect with Ed and find out more, a great place to start is his website. Once again, you can find that at eddouglas.com. And Ed, I just want to say thanks so much for sharing with us today. It's been a great pleasure and an honor to have you on the show. Well, my pleasure and honor too, Sean. Thank you very much.